There's something interesting in Luke chapter 10 you may have never thought of. In this story, Jesus is asked a question of how to inherit eternal life. He flips the question back on the man and says, how do you interpret the law? When the man answers correctly, saying that you should love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself, Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. But this lawyer wants to press Jesus on a contemporary issue, so he asks him, who is my neighbor? And instead of giving a definition, instead of giving a bifurcation or a trifurcation, a categorization of who is and who isn't his neighbor, Jesus tells him a story. And this is the funny thing. Why does Jesus tell a story to answer this question? That's what I want to explore today. Today we are continuing our series in the people that changed my mind on Genesis. We're getting to the tail end of my story here. Uh, While it is not, I guess, the ultimate end, it is what I see as the end of things, at least at this moment, that would be most helpful for you. I pray that it has been. I hope it has been. Um, And today we're going to be talking about the Bama podcast with Marty Solomon. It was three or four years ago now. I was listening. I heard about this podcast. I'd been listening or I had a couple friends who recommended it. I ended up listening to it. And and then uh, I was working out in the basement at my folks' house. And uh, I was listening to the first ep- the actual first episode. This is episode zero. We're going to talk about the introduction here. But it was the thing that pushed me over the cliff was the Bama podcast. So we're tracking the the story here. This is about about the end. Um, we're gonna we're gonna react to another Tim Mackey talk here in the final one. At least for me, Dan is gonna have some some content coming here as well in this series. But I I want to start with the Bama podcast here, and I want to start with this first episode. Not necessarily because it automatically changed my mind on Genesis, as it were, directly. But it was an indirect, subliminal thing that really helped begin to shape me in these new ways of thinking that I've been trying to explain to you guys and and trying to describe this conversion, quote-unquote, that I had. A certain number of years ago, still continuing. And so we're going to start with Bama Podcasts, the very first introductory episode. They're going to talk about the Eastern mindset versus the Western mindset. And this we're simplifying it a lot. It's not, I don't think at in the final analysis, it is something that is this opaquely different. It is not, it is not this ambivalent or I guess it is, you should say, it is a bit more ambivalent, but I think they lay out some good things that we should keep in mind here. And so, so let's just, let's just go through some, some stuff as we talk about what's going on with the Eastern mindset versus the Western mindset. When we study the Tower of Babel, um, I think it's going to come up pretty quickly in our study this idea. So it's not horrible. We can't be Eastern. Um, We can't. Even me uh, as a Jew, uh, I'm still Western. I was raised in a Western culture. I'm as Western as it gets. Um, As much as I wish I were Eastern, I'm not. And uh, that's not the goal to change who I am. The goal is to understand the Bible so that I can apply the Bible to who I am and the world I live in. And that's that's what's important. So yeah, it might be a couple years, but if you're feeling inadequate or that you're in the wrong place or that you don't have anything to offer, give it a couple years. We'll bring it back around. Just a Uh, couple. But we do have a lot to cover with this Eastern perspective. That 
comma, I'm just gonna make this quick note. That comma right there, it's gonna take a couple years. It's probably true. If your mind has been totally changed just by watching four or five, however many videos end up being in this playlist, I I I doubt it. I kinda do. Cause it takes it takes a long time. You gotta chew on it. You gotta it's gotta sit in you, gotta sit with you. And then the changes will start to occur. Then these things will keep building. The this it will snowball. And this whole process I've been trying to illuminate here has taken me years. I'm just trying to give you the snapshots, give you the give you the big turning points for me. So I just want to say that if you're if you're like, man, I, I feel what you're saying. I like what you're saying. I can I can my ears are perking up. I'm leaning in. I'm starting to get this, but I'm not there yet. That's fine. You don't got to be here yet. It's going to take a while. We want everything so fast. We want to drive. We want to drive through experience of transformation, and that's not the way it works. And so, just be okay. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Listen to the Bima podcast. Listen to session one. Listen to session two. Start watching Jonathan Pedro. Start listening to Peterson. Start reading your Bible. You know, doing these things and slowly, slowly, it'll start to happen. We're not just talking about you purely reading the Bible literarily, which I wouldn't recommend either. My point is bigger than that. If you feel these things starting to shift, if you feel like there's something, there's something you're inclining, there's something that you're intuiting to be true, but don't know how to get there yet, just lean in and let it take some time. Let it take some time. We want everything so fast. We want a microwave experience. We want to drive through experience with all these things that transform. This is just one example of a transformation for me. You can't drive through this. You can't. Uh, that we're not familiar with at all because it's simply not our culture. Uh, so we have uh, a slideshow that we'll have in the show notes. Uh, you can find that at baymadiscipleship.com or in your podcast app of choice, if you're listening that way. Uh, so Marty, why don't you walk us uh, through that? Let's start specifically with uh, the way that we think about things. Yeah, so I want to put these two worldviews next to each other so we can appreciate the differences. So uh, if we start with way of thinking, um, I want to start with words and how a Greek and uh, a Hebrew thinker see words differently. For the Western thought, for the Greek thinker, which would be the world that you and I are used to, um, we use words to express truth, um, and we use definitions. We prefer prose and outlines and lists and bullet points. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just look at the presentation when you download it. It is this wonderful PowerPoint with sections and bullet points and definitions and subtitles. That is how we use words. We use words to communicate uh, truth in, in prose and definitions. But a, a Hebrew thinker, an Eastern thinker, uses words to express truth in picture and in story. Uh, so an Eastern thinker does not use definitions. An Eastern thinker prefers poetry and imagery and symbolism. And one of the ways I think you see this is if a Westerner, if you if you ask a Westerner like, what are the attributes of God or what is God like? They're going to say things like omniscient and omnipresent and sovereign and loving. Each one of these things is a word that comes with a definition that you have to understand in order to have that conversation. Ask an Easterner, what is God like? And an Easterner is going to say, God is a fortress. God is, God is eagle's wings. And it still has all kinds of meaning packed into it, but for, from a completely different place. It's a picture 
a poetic image that's meant to communicate. God is a fortress. How That communicates things that we could talk about for the next 10 minutes. Uh, God is a fortress. Um, but it's not a definition, and it's not prose. So the other thing I think we could talk about um, if we were to move on next would be the numbers. And you think to yourself, like, how how in the world can numbers be different? Like, numbers are the... One of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is is this is this story you know as you enter into a new space as you as unmapped territory becomes mapped territory you start to understand what attracted you to that exp- exploration and then you see other things even further back that that you didn't see before and one of the things that i realize even just now in in looking at this is that those of us who may be more artistic some of those some of us who who as we were children dreamed about writing our own stories some of us who took up poetry in high school some of us who ended up making music when we were younger are attracted to let me let me show it again are 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 all already predisposed to this Eastern way of thinking in a very Western world when we don't even realize it. This is what great storytellers, this is what great artists, this is what great poets, great great rappers, great musicians, great great filmmakers understand. And this is why they they're always kind of on the edge. In some, in some, sorry, in some real sense, they are always on the edge because, and I'll get into more of this stuff in a different series, but, but, but I think my artistic inclinations, or even early in life, pre-exposed me, were predeterminative, that I that I would find this way of thinking very attractive and and would be in a lot of ways disillusioned with this purely materialistic sense in which many people wanted to interpret the bible as i got older because i'm I, it's something we say on this podcast all the time why would it be any other way why would god in using narrative and using characters and 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 expressing these truths be merely talking about the the physical actions of these people, of these things, of these events. I don't want to take that too far. We're going to get caught off in another rabbit trail here. All I want to say is, you know, when I when I was younger, and I wish to do some more now, but when when you know, when I was in college, when when I was in high school, late in high school, when I was writing poetry and I would make rap music, I would. I would I would obsess over over expressing over expressing truth in in words and pictures and stories. And that was way different than when I would when I would uh, would write an essay, but I found that if I can write an essay in using these eastern ways, it becomes way more vibrant. And this is what good writers understand, even good Western writers understand, is that if you can marry these two things, you're going to have something that's very powerful. So I want to read to you something, something quickly. Lewis says this, and keep in mind, again, Easter versus mindset, definitions versus pictures. This is in the beginning. Right and wrong is a clue to the meaning of the universe. He's talking, he's trying to introduce the idea of this law of human nature. And he's not going to start it by talking about what is law and what is human nature and how do we define our terms here. Listen to how he starts. Everyone has heard people quarreling. Sometimes it sounds funny and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kinds of things they say. They say things like, 
How'd you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He wasn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on. You promised. People say these things every day. Educated people as well as uneducated people. And children as well as grown-ups. Now, what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him. It's not purely subjective. He is appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out what he had been doing does not really go against the standard. Or that if it does, there is something, there is some special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of the orange, or that something has turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law, of rule, or fair play, or decent behavior, or morality, or whatever you like to call it, about which they really agree, and they have. If they had not, they might, of course, fight like animals, but they could not quarrel in the human sense of the words. In the human sense of the words. (laughs) Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong, and there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and he had some sort of agreement about what was right. And what was wrong? What we have here is Lewis using, he's using this picture. What does it mean to quarrel? I'm not going to define quarreling for you. I merely want to show you. I want to show you, not tell you. Because we all see it. And I'll give you some examples of what it is to quarrel. And you tell me if this picture is like something you've seen. And then you tell me of this conclusion that they're not only saying in a subjective sense that that thing is wrong, but they're appealing to something that is wrong because they know that the other person knows this. He's not defining definitions. He's drawing us pictures. And then he's saying, let us investigate what this really means. And then he goes on to give definitions later. But the thing that's beautiful, the thing that's absolutely beautiful about this whole book and in, in being mere Christianity, is that almost every chapter begins with an image. And there is something, I think this this speaks to the timelessness of this book. Well, I would not argue that it is his most timeless book. I think this speaks to the timelessness of the book in the fact that he starts and uses images. This is his poetic mind speaking. Um, McGrath makes much of the failed poet that Lewis is or was before he became a prose author and much less a apologist for Christianity. But I think that is this again, this as you know, I told you as, as I make rap music, as as I, as I write, as I try and infuse these things, here's what Lewis is doing. Infusing his poetic senses with his essay writing. He doesn't just give us definitions, he gives us images. You know, again, as we see here, he is predisposed, again, this is, you investigate further and further back, you see it everywhere. He is giving us the poetry, the image, the symbol. He's not just using words, definitions, and ideas. He's using ideas and definitions, true. But it is in using the imagery and the symbolism that inform the ideas, the definitions. And so, so this is just another example of someone who uses an Eastern mindset when communicating with a Western audience. And in blending the two, you get some real beauty. This doesn't make one greater necessarily in every case than the other, 
But it is to say that there is power in both ways, and we cannot just reject one in favor of the other. There is, there is some marriage, some intertwining here that must happen. So this is the difference in the Eastern Western mindset with, with words. We're going to go on talk about numbers here. So let's hear what Marty has to say about numbers. Pretty much like the most straightforward thing we have. Um, a Greek like you and me, uh, we think of numbers primarily as quantity. And if this is the first time you've ever run into this conversation, you're probably thinking, how else can you view a number? That's like the definition of a number as quantity. Um, but an Easterner doesn't see quantity. An Easterner sees quality and symbol. One of the ways that this comes out uh, in their world is when they go to schooling and they go uh, to take part in their education, where we would just learn math, we would learn five plus two equals seven. Uh, for them, it's books of Moses plus tablets of Moses equals days of creation, mm-hmm. is literally how in orthodox circles, uh, especially in history, they have learned. When they see five apples sitting on a table, uh, they immediately think Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, because numbers and quantity isn't just quantity, it's symbolic of something else because their world is driven by pictures. And that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we can't think of numbers in any other way, right? No, not at all. In fact, you can actually overdo this quite a bit, but numbers will be one of the things we run into very, very early in our study. In fact, starting next week, we're going to run into numbers. Um, And once you kind of start to understand how a Hebrew sees numbers, a lot of people start to overdo it. They start to really see numbers everywhere and over apply allegorically uh, numbers, but it's something you just kind of get used to how an Easterner uses numbers. And there's always a conversation to be had there, but Yes, numbers are still also numbers in the Bible, too. And we don't want to take away from that, but we want to learn to ask a different set of questions when it comes to the number. And there's really not that many numbers uh, that have this qualitative meaning. And I assume we'll get to those at some future point. But once you learn them, like, it's a lot of fun. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Numbers here are important, obviously, because we're talking about Genesis, and one of the questions about Genesis, I'm going to make a video on this, is, is it literally seven days? We had Jordan Peterson and John Lennox help us think about that kind of thing. That'll be in this playlist here with the rest of these videos, if you want to watch that one. Um, And neither of them got into the numerology of of the Bible, but let's let's talk about this for a second because there's there's many ways in which we know this, even as good Protestant Christians, you know, good Bible, good Bible readers, good materialists. Um, We'll still understand that 40 is a number that is associated with testing. So the flood lasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And many people, when pressed, will say, well, can the earth really get covered in water in 40 days? I guess technically... It could depend on how hard it's raining or if there's other sources of flooding rather than just the rain. But most people understand, even when I was a child, most people understand 40 is the number of testing. So that's what's being explained here. So that, again, it's a way in which people interestingly break out of their materialist structures to interpret the Bible, but then also insist that you should read it, in most cases, like a materialist. Uh, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness. Israel spends 40 years in the wilderness. Elijah spends 40 days wandering. Um, I'm sure there are many more that I can't think of off the top of my head. 
But we see, we understand this. About 47 is the number of completion. Obviously, um, creation happens in uh, seven and sets of sevens, as we will hear in the next episode. And there are seven days taken to day at the temple. Uh, seven years, many times, is used in this sense. And so we, we three, if you're a Christian, Obviously, the number three, the Trinity, is important, um, obviously. Uh, and so we look for three everywhere. Um, we understand this. This is nothing necessarily new, but again, we're reading an Eastern book in the Bible here. If you can think of any ways in which, I mean, obviously these numbers are going to get used in other literature because the Bible is so such an important, and such foundational text to much other literature. But if you can think of any ways in which numbers are used in specific ways in other stories, other books, uh, popular fiction, or uh, literary classics, please comment them below. To help make my point here, we understand this. Again, we understand this many times, even when we're reading other literature. But we would strip that when we when we read the Bible. This is one of the things I comment on all the time. But this is important again to understand that what what we're what I'm trying to talk about here is this conversion process that that happened with me and trying to read the Bible more literarily, more symbolically, if you will. Not to say that it's stripped of its history or its material importance or it's factualness in that sense of the earthy world. But remember, I'm, I've been through all the things we've already talked about in this series. I've been through Tim Mackey saying, well, maybe the questions that you're asking about the Bible, maybe the things you're pulling as major points, major emphases, are not the major emphases, as Lennox wants to put it. Maybe, as Peterson points out to us, that the materialness of the questions that you're asking aren't the questions you should be asking. Maybe there's a, an implication here about how you should act. And then as I'm growing as an artist... As I'm starting to make music, as I'm starting to write poetry, as I've been, you know, doing this thing as I was in high school, into college, as I'm finding the Bama podcast, as Marty's trying to continually say, maybe there's a better set of questions, maybe the questions you've come to the text with aren't the set of questions that are most important and most going to affect your life as I'm reading C.S. Lewis as he begins mere Christianity and every subsequent chapter with images that are important to help us get our hands around what is going on here. I begin to see, oh... I've grown up in a particular worldview with a particular paradigm, as Lewis would talk about, with a particular set of glasses through which to see the world, and I bring this to the text. And what I have been experiencing throughout this whole transformation, this whole conversion, is a adoption into a different way to see. My prescription has changed. And he gave, in a very Western way, <laughs> he started to give me an outline, some bullet points for how I can then categorize this transformation that has happened to me. And we'll talk again next week, next episode, about his particular comments on Genesis that helped push me over the cliff and start to say, though, yes, yes, I've been thinking of it purely in these Western terms, but there is something else going on here. So I wanted to make this episode, and I'm hopefully going to trim this up, make it fairly short, but just to to give you some, to give you this next step of progression that isn't directly connected to the creation story, but is essential in helping us, as Marty is doing in this Western way, help us get Eastern categories, at least in our minds. 
And then as Michael Heiser would say, you know, you want that ancient Israelite living in your head. This, the ancient Israelite, I think, really started living in my head right when I started listening to Bama. Really. Actually. At least, that's what started it. And I read Heiser after I have been listening to Bama, and that's a whole other conversation. But I think I'll leave this here for now. If you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. Again, we'll have a second episode in this little two-parter series within this larger series of the Bama podcast, Change My Mind on Genesis. So stick around for the next episode if you if you made it this far. Wonderful. Um, but thank you very much for watching. I hope this is helpful in maybe describing some things you're feeling at the moment about how your mind is changing, about how you are maybe predisposed to some of these Eastern ways of thinking because you are artistic, because you had certain inclinations towards creativity that caused you to see the world this way, even just in terms of personality. And if you've read Mere Christian, if you've, if you've read enough Lewis, you will know what I mean when I, when I pull him in here and what, what that means for us. And so, again, thank you very much for watching. I guess I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.